Thank you, Beth. That was a really interesting discussion to listen to. And some of those th- things you talked about on economic policy, we are going to come back to in this debate. Because the Institute for Fiscal Studies has criticised the manifestos of the two largest parties, Labour and the Conservatives, saying that Conservatives would be likely to break their spending pledges, considering the uncosted pledges for national insurance cuts and improvements to social care, and that Labour's plans were not credible and Labour would likely need to raise taxes further than they've promised to pay for spending, spending pledges. Aaron, are Labour's plans credible? Right, so it's important, uh, just touching on the IFS, the IFS was founded by a Tory politician, a stockbroker and an investment fund manager. Now, whilst it's, it's just because you were, you were painting them out to be the sort of like neutral scientific body, that there is an interest there, but regardless, taking the data as face value, are Labour's policies credible? Uh, assuming they're not, then the cost of acting, when you've, we've got 11 years to cut carbon emissions in half, the cost of acting is... The cost of not acting is far greater than the cost of acting. But why they, why they would be credible? So first of all, under a Labour government, we're likely to have a, a very soft Brexit or remain. That, th- that, that would give these £6 billion, uh, remain boosts, which the Lib Dems talk about, uh, L- L- Labour would have. You would also have, with £250 billion investment banks, massive, massive levels uh, of funding, multiplier effects, which the RFS uh, historically, not historically, but, but are known, have, have a reputation of underestimating. Right, Aaron, if the IFS has these interests and isn't, you know, a force that you sort of appreciate, why do IFS estimates include in Labour's costings for their manifesto? Well, that, like, uh, sorry, I'm, not, I'm not saying that the IFS aren't to be trusted. It's just important when we do refer to think tanks and research bodies that we acknowledge their interests there. Like, 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 I'm not saying that the data is poorly collected or inaccurate. Uh, it's, just, it's important we know where power's coming from. Um, oh, Faye wants to come in on this. Um, I'd just like to raise the point that you're, you're saying that um, you know, the cost of not acting in the face of climate change is going to be greater than the cost of acting, but how does rolling out free Wi-Fi for the entire country help the climate? Oh, massively. Massively. You don't need to drive everywhere. If you don't, you don't, you can, you can, you, lots of these places where, where public transport is limited and people work away, people live away from their work, they have to drive every day. With, with free, 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 fast Wi-Fi ev- across the country, there'll be far more satellite working, will be uh, far, far more possible meeting up in, in shorter distances would be a lot more likely uh, free broadband's great for, the, great for the planet is free broadband great for the planet Tom? well it's, um, it's the, you get into the big question of do you trust politicians to handle the internet and the vast majority of politicians know absolutely nothing about the internet so I, I'd, I'd want to see stuff like a digital bill of rights enshrined in law before I even wanted to start to allow and who would make that digital bill of rights not politicians? Well, it's, it's the, the, fact, the fact is both the Labour Party and the Conservative Party pushed through the Snoopers Charter through the House of Commons and have pushed through massively, you know, overreaching, civil liberty breaching um, legislation in regards to, you know, privacy. And that is not something, you know, which, which I then want the party who, you know, the Labour Party along with the Tories, but the Labour Party voted for the Snoopers Charter. And I would not want the party who voted for that then put in charge of our internet. So um, I, I, I think, you know, it's a massive white elephant to distract us from you know, the, the bigger issue, which is um, internet safety, internet privacy and inter- internet security. But there's a few things, if, if I may, um, on what Aaron said. Firstly, um, I, I think it's completely ridiculous to bring up the funding sources of the IFS um, on the basis it's just not relevant to what we're talking about. We should, um, fi- if, you know, if, if, the, if the IFS were, um, were this massively Tory funded organisation um, and, and, and that, you know, and that had a discernible impact on the research they were producing then you know they'd, they'd be massively heralding the Conservative Party as the party we should all vote for, which they're not, because they're rubbishing the Conservative Party plans as well. Um, but something else you mentioned is under a Labour government, we'd likely to have either a main or a soft Brexit. We wouldn't have a soft Brexit under a Labour government because Jeremy Corbyn's Brexit deal would take us out of the single market and take us out of the customs union. That is not in any discernible way a soft Brexit. It's a hard Brexit. We'd be crashing out the single market and crashing out the customs union. I don't want to spend the whole time sort of talking about Brexit, and I do want to say the criticism that Tom mentions from the IFS about the Conservative Party, these unfunded promises, have the Conservative Party given up on being the party of fiscal responsibility? Um, I don't know. We, we've got some, definitely some ambitious um, policies, but I think we've also got ways of funding these things because our policies are going to help, are going to boost the economy and thus provide us um, with the funding to keep up the policies. You say ambitious, and the, R- the RFS does disagree when we keep wrong with them. There's essentially nothing new in the Conservative manifesto. It would be limited for a budget, never mind a manifesto. What makes your plans so ambitious, so good for this country? Well, you know, things like wage... wage 
raising the national living wage to 50 now. I mean, that's something that's going to be very good for the average person in the country. And then things like abolishing the... Um, business tax for small businesses uh, up to a certain level. It's boosting the economy, it's putting money in from the bottom, encouraging small business, revitalising the high street. All of the things that we've seen declining in the last um, years in the rise of the 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 internet. So no, we may not be doing anything new, but that's because these policies before, they didn't need to be done. They were there, but they weren't important, so to speak, because now we need to tackle an issue that wasn't really an issue yeah. 10 years ago. Um, and I want to come to Antoine on this. Your, your pledge to run a budget surplus as a target in your manifesto, is this necessary and can you achieve it without any more cutbacks? Um, I mean, yes, we can. Um, the Liberal Democrat manifesto is fully costed. Um, you know, the costumes are all available online. The fact check, fact check team can completely scour them as they please. Um, but the fact is the Liberal Democrat manifesto is fully costed. We've not made any additional spending promises after the release of the manifesto. And, you know, we, we've made clear our plans to run a budget surplus without doing that. And one of the best ways in order to make sure we can fund, we, we can run a budget surplus and fund our public services is by remaining in the European Union, getting that £50 billion remain bonus over the space of the next parliament, um, which, again, the, um, the IFS have called our estimate of £50 billion, a cautious estimate, and it's based on research that they've done in their paper of a Green, green New Deal, I think it's called. Um, so, no, I, I don't think, you know, we're, we're going to have to go to sort of deep cuts in order to run a budget surplus. And you mentioned post-election, post-manifesto promises there. Um, Aaron, you cla- the claim is that the Labour manifesto is fully costed, but you made a £58 billion, your own estimate, pledge for women who've been affected by the state pension age increase after the manifesto launch. How will you pay for that? Right, so uh, the, the Grey Book ha- ha- has, has everything. It, it doesn't have this pledge because this is a post-manifesto. Ah, uh, oh, f- <laughs> I, you can't. You can't use that word. Oh, sorry, you sorry, can't use that sorry, word. Sorry. I'm just going to apologise for sorry, if anyone heard that. Sorry for the language <laughs> and to everyone that heard that. Um, yeah. So, so ultimately, th- th- this this 58 billion, all these pledges, like any grey book, which both uh, Labour and the Lib Dems have, have released an equivalent of, are based on models and predictions, uh, th- things things that uh, economists have chosen to include and exclude from their models. That, so, so really, that they're, they're all they're all they're all speculative. Uh, so, so, so this this fifty eight billion, which which we'll be returning, it's not like fifty eight billion overnight. It is over the course of these pension payments. We're, we're not returning it immediately. So, so, so there there are ways ways to. Tom. Yeah, I, I think I think it's right that you point out. You know, both parties have released costumes for the manifesto. The only difference is we're sticking to ours. Um, you 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 say you know it's 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 you, you try and you know play down and say it's um, getting spent over these years. But the fact is the money's still getting spent. Um, it, I, I, I for what's worth, I think it's an absolute shame and a disgrace to the WASPy women who were affected by the changes that you know that these changes weren't included in the manifesto and the Labour manifesto is you know massively lacking. And um, the Liberal Democrats are pledging to spend more on mental health. We're giving more. The Labour Party, so I think the Labour Party pledging 1.6 billion, the Liberal Democrats pledging 2.2 a year. Um, in regards to free childcare, the Liberal Democrats are pledging a lot more and a lot more ambitious promises than the Labour Party are because the Labour Party, you know, cannot guarantee certainty with Brexit. You know, we, we don't know what a Labour government will look like, whether it will have the Remain bonus or not. And, you know, the massive uncertainty created around that, like, Labour is not a credible option. Tom, and as Aaron mentioned, both Labour and the Lib Dems at least made attempts to cost a manifesto. Faye, if the Conservative Party are going to criticise Labour for making promises that you say they can't afford, where are the costings for your manifesto and why haven't they been released? Um, because we don't feel the need to release our costings. We believe that it is fully costed um, and we don't if feel you the need to justify it. Just can't you show us? If, if, yeah, that, that's, that's a fair point. Do you want to respond? Uh, well, I'll have to take that one to CCHQ. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, I'll let Anne. Yeah, just before we move on from the economy, so like, yeah. it's been mainly focused on bu- budgetary and, mm. and what it was in that, but the most important section of the economy, in fact, the only real tangible section of the economy is labour. Labour and how labour is organised. There's only one party that is seriously addressing this issue in this election. Labour will will rep- repeal all the anti-trade union legislation of the coalition government. And we have to finish off there. There's been a lot of claims there. And there's been, I know we, we, all, we want to talk about the economy forever. We want oh. to talk about all these things forever. I'm sure we can have oh, all sure. sorts of debates. But I do want to give, go back to Beth and the Studio Blue analysis team.